Hello everyone, welcome to part two of chapter five, dealing with aspects of membrane transport. So I've thought a little bit about this and I've tried to come up with a, with a way to try to present this uh, through this format. Uh, we may end up doing it in class anyway uh, on, and, you know, during our synchronous sessions. But again, the question here is why do we have the ability to be hypotonic, which causes the cell to swell and burst, even though the solution is hyperosmotic, like in part one of our lab. That's because some solutes are penetrating and will diffuse down their concentration gradients, thus altering which solutes are where and where the water goes. The first simple rule to remember is that if both A and B are non-penetrating, then whatever the difference in osmolarity between the inside and outside will be made up solely of water. So most cells have aquaporins that allow water to equilibrate. So in this case, it looks like B is a little denser than A, which means that the water is a little bit less dense inside the cell, and so water would move in. But that's the hard and fast rule about non-permeant uh, solutes. Um, in intracellular solutes generally are non-permeant. It's the question of whether the extracellular solutes are permeant or not. But if they're not permeant, then the iso and os the or the the uh, the osmolarity and the tonicity are identical. That's the easy scenario. However, if we have a penetrating solute. Like in this case, if we have A that's able to move down its concentration gradient into the cell, now the osmolarity inside the cell is now A plus B. So B, whatever was already there, plus whatever has come in. That's the key, is that if this could be hyperosmotic out here, but if A can start to creep in now, we might have more of A plus B inside here than we have of A on the outside, which means that the cell could then be, it could have a hypotonic effect. Remember the osmolarity is the before. So if we were to just have a cell somewhere and a solution of A somewhere, A would be hyperosmotic probably in this situation. Even if it, the osmolarity of the cell changes, we don't account for that change. We just account for the effect. The, the magnitude of the effect, if it's hypotonic, then it must have a very penetrating cell. If it's iso, that must mean a little bit of A creeps in. Just enough A to creep in so that it equalizes with the outer compartment. So that's why hyperosmotic solutions that have penetrating solute can be either hyper tonic, isotonic, or hypotonic. And the same thing is true with isoosmotic. Depending on how much material moves through, it can either be isotonic or hypotonic. Can't be hyper. Hypoosmotic solutions can never be iso or hypertonic because they always have less concentration than the, than the inside of the cell. So the iso and the hyperosmotics, the question is how penetrating is uh, the solute in that, uh, in that solution. Moving on into the transport processes, the simplest one of all is diffusion. That's because diffusion will occur if there's a gradient and the material can, uh, can move. That's what makes it passive. It, it, it can utilize the energy that is already in the system. We're always moving from a high concentration or to a low concentration. That can be what we call a chemical gradient. Um, it's always moving down that pathway. It's, it's, you, have to in, you have to invest energy if you want to go the other way. We are seeking an equilibrium. By going down the concentration gradient, we're moving to a point where the net movement is equal in any direction that's involved in the system. That is to say we're moving, if, if we only have a two-dimensional system like left and right, then we were moving right the same rate, relative rate as we're moving left. It is seeking equilibrium. A lot of the time in biology, though, we're not letting it reach it. It's rapid over short distances, and that's why 
um, exchange membranes, membranes that facilitate uh, diffusion, are often very, very thin. The thicker the membrane, the slower the diffusion. The greater the distance, the slower the movement. You don't even have to, or the slower the net diffusion. You don't even have to have a membrane. And we'll show some examples of that uh, here in a second. It's directly related to temperature. Why? Because temperature is the relative energy in the system. It's kinetic energy in the system is what temperature is. And it's inversely related to molecular weight and or size. I say and or. At the molecular level, most of the time, size and molecular weight are going to be the same. However, there are some polymers out there like DNA or proteins that if they get unfolded and splayed out, that maybe they would have a larger size because their density is less. But that's pretty unusual. So we can, pretty, we can generalize in this situation that the higher the molecular weight, the bigger the, the molecule is and the slower it will diffuse. Like I said, it can occur in open systems. Like, for instance, you can drop a, a drop of food coloring in, a, in, a, in a, 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 an aquarium or, or a glass of water. And eventually what you would see is diffusion of those, of those food particle uh, or food, food coloring particles. Uh, or it can move across a membrane. This is uh, an example of where we have a small molecule and a large one. We did this experiment in 165. Um, the small molecule, potassium iodide, will diffuse faster in this, uh, in this agarose than the Congo red will. Uh, and if you change the temperature, you'll see larger distances for both. You lower the temperature, smaller distances for both. A very useful chart from Silverthorne, Table 5.6, Chapter 5, basically listing exactly what I mentioned uh, in the previous slide, the, law, you know, the, the factors that can influence diffusion. So you should be able to predict what will happen if we change the conditions of the diffusional event. So these are the rules that we talked before, but we now need to apply them to, um, to biological systems and specifically across biologic membranes. First thing to remember, biological membranes are, have a hydrophobic core. Biologic membranes can be various sizes as well. So we have what's called Fick's Law, F-I-C-K apostrophe S, and I'll probably show you a picture of it here in a second. What it's saying is that you can not only have these, but if the membrane is involved, if you have more surface area on that membrane, like for instance, let's say this green area here is a membrane. More surface area means more opportunity for molecules to interact with it and go through it. So if you have a larger surface area, that means the relative rate of diffusion is faster. If the membrane is thinner, and there are differences in membrane thickness, there are different kinds of phospholipids, and some have longer tails than others, but by and large, we can presume a relatively uh, homogeneous thickness. But when we're talking about, like, for instance, cell membranes, like an epithelium, or a macro membrane, like uh, the, the tissue surrounding your heart, the thinner the membrane, the faster the relative rate of diffusion, and that gets back to distance. Concentration gradient, that's self-evident, because that's a basic rule of diffusion. And is the membrane, quote unquote, more permeable to the molecule? That's a very, very general statement. And there are two things that can, that can apply here. Either we make the membrane more permeable to the molecule by putting proteins in there, like channels and carriers, or the molecule has differing hydrophobicity or hydrophilicity. So a more hydrophobic molecule, the other word is lipophilic, a more lipophilic molecule is more permeant because it can pass through that lipid bilayer. It is capable of moving through. And that's the example that you have in your lab. You have five different solutions, all of which can contain relatively, relatively, they're not super hydrophobic, they can still go in solution. Relatively hydrophobic, say compared to sodium and chloride, that makes them much more permeable to the membranes. That means they can move much quicker across the membranes than ions could, even under the best of circumstances. And so that's what we mean by more permeable. More permeable can be the molecule's lipid solubility, how lipophilic or hydrophobic it is, the molecule's size, 
and or the composition of the membrane. But let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Nicotine, a small molecule, very, very lipophilic. It's able to actually move through relatively thick membranes without too much trouble. Like for instance, you can put a nicotine patch on your skin and it will fly right through your skin. Let's pretend that this is a, a normal membrane and this is your skin up here. We got all kinds of membranes here, light ones and dark ones. That nicotine can move down through there and through many membranes, it's so lipophilic. So the lipid solubility is high, that allows it to be very, very, you know, follow its concentration gradient very, very easily. And so that's Fick's law. Fick's law talks about the surface area of the membrane, the concentration gradient that's involved, and the overall permeability, whether it's the membrane or it's the molecule. The key here is to understand how those inputs affect the overall system in terms of the rate of diffusion. Solubility of, of the molecule, the lipid solubility, the hydrophobicity, the size of the molecule, the, the strength of the gradient, the surface area of the membrane, and the, and the composition thereof. The, the, the total area of the membrane inside your lungs right now is about the size of a tennis court. That's because that it's, it's playing into fixed law. They have large amounts of surface area to facilitate large amounts of rapid diffusion in that exchange membrane that we call the alveoli of your lungs. And again, lipid solubility like this molecule, super lipid soluble, will fly through a membrane. I once was camping in a field in Kentucky um, just because I was, it was late at night and I needed a place to sleep. I was getting really sleepy and so I just found a field that I thought I wouldn't be seen, wouldn't bother anybody. Woke up in the morning kind of early, packed my tent and got to my car. As I was going through the field, I realized it was a tobacco field. And, I, and as I was moving through the field, I started getting dizzy to the point that I was getting nearly sick. Why? Because that nicotine was diffusing off of the leaves of the tobacco and into my skin and my bloodstream and was affecting me. I couldn't drive for a few minutes just because I was feeling like I'd had a six pack. It was, it was an amazing experience. And it taught me a lesson about lipid solubility in membranes. In addition to diffusion and osmosis, which are passive processes, we also have uh, other forms of transport processes, most notably uh, facilitated diffusion and, and protein-mediated transport, that we call regulated transport. But there's this other category, and maybe it's a little bit out you know, of, of a sidestep here, but uh, we'll talk about it anyway. It's called bulk flow. And bulk flow is where you have gases and liquids moving in large amounts. What I mean to say is in milliliters or liters per hour or liters per second, that sort of a thing. Um, Non-osmotic in nature. Uh, we're talking about things like muscular contraction, like for instance, when your heart squeezes uh, and, and blood flows through the, the vasculature. That's an example of bulk flow. Uh, gravity can also play a role. Like for instance, you can have what's called orthostatic hypotension. Like if you are uh, lying down and suddenly you jump up and you're dizzy for a second because the blood is shifting in different ways, that's a bulk flow event. Um, breathing is another form of event. And I have an example of yet another one on the next slide. This is an example of what's occurring in the filtration part of your kidney, the area known as Bowman's capsule or the glomerulus, which is inside that capsule. The glomerulus contains specialized capillaries that have these little pores running through from the inside of the capillary into the extracellular fluid. Rather than a transcellular type situation, these, these portals are here for bulk flow. They use hydrostatic pressure in order to move fluid out of the blood plasma and into the filtrate part, uh, which will be processed to become uh, urine. The other side of the coin, as I mentioned, is a much bigger topic, and that is regulated transport uh, across membranes. This involves proteins. It can be active, it can be passive, it can be going down its concentration or up its concentration, or uh, even vesicular transport is considered part of regulated transport. But the, the glue that links all those together is proteins.
So all of these processes inscribed inside this red box require proteins, whether it is facilitating a passive process, that is to say facilitating movement of molecules down a concentration gradient that otherwise couldn't because uh, the membrane is standing in their way or something else. We have active transport. I'm going to start over here. I'm not going to worry about secondary just yet. We're going to start with primary active transport, and that's where we're using a protein to literally pump things across uh, or against the concentration gradient, often using ATP or almost always using ATP. We call these protein pumps because they're pumping things up like we would be pumping water up into a water tower. What we're doing is we're moving things that otherwise wouldn't move against their concentration gradient and or the membrane. But importantly, oftentimes that primary active transport is, is making, is storing energy in the form of a concentration gradient. And that energy can then be used to move other things. And I'll, I'll be getting to that later on in the lecture, this idea of secondary active transport. Then we have vesicular transport over here on the right. Um, endocytosis, phagocytosis, exocytosis. These are all examples of this. Really not going to get involved in that very much. Uh, yeah, that's more of a cell biology thing. It's nice, but we don't have to cover it. So to be completely honest with you, this slide sometimes bothers me a little bit because we talk about membrane proteins. These are proteins associated with, with the membrane. Usually we mean the plasma membrane, and that can include all of these fun things, structural proteins that we've talked about, like, like uh, junctions and CAMs. Uh, enzymes in some cases. We actually have uh, enzymes both on the inside and sometimes on the outside of, of plasma membranes to, to do stuff. When we get to uh, uh, neuronal transmission, we'll see that. And then we have membrane receptor proteins. And then we have, so these guys are involved in, in information flow across the membrane. And then we have the transporters, right? The truth is there are transporters that do those other things too. A, I love, sometimes we have arbitrary, uh, arbitrary you know, uh, ways of pigeonholing things that don't really cover everything the way that it really is. And that's because some transporters are receptors and some are, you know, that sort of thing. Right? So we have two major families of proteins that, in addition to maybe those other things that are transporters, that is to say channels, and carriers. Channels open can be open all the time or they can open and close. Uh, carriers, usually what they do is they involve a non-covalent interaction of some kind with the molecule that they are carriers of and then they change the shape and release it on the other side of the membrane. Those can be both passive and active and I'm going to break those out by example uh, here over the next few slides. If you see a figure like this, the number one thing you want to pay attention to is concentration gradient. Like, for instance, this is just diffusion over here where those little red dots are diffusing down their concentration. There's only one on this side. These two here, you can tell, do not require energy because, again, yellow is going down its concentration gradient. Blue is going down its concentration gradient. Green, on the other hand, is going up its concentration gradient, and they even put the little energy thing here. So you know that's active transport. In this case, it would uh, almost certainly be primary active transport if you use ATP, but there are other forms, and we will get to those this semester. So let's start over on the left side of this silver thorn figure, where we have the channels. There are two flavors of channels general flavors, if you will. One is what we would call open channels. Sometimes we would refer to them as constitutively open. When it is constitutively open, it means it's open all the time. For instance, there are glucose transporters that are always open. They become the glute transporters. How we regulate whether or not they transport is whether or not they're present in the plasma membrane at any given time. Some of them are present all the time, like in neural tissue and in heart tissue or kidney, but other ones get transported to the surface of the cell in times of need, like in muscle. So we have, but they're always open. When they're on the plasma membrane or on a membrane surface, they're always open. Then we have what are called gated channels, which open and close. So let's, let's 
uh, these guys open and close often in response to some change or some presence or absence of some signal. But I have examples of that over the next few slides. So channel proteins and channel protein complexes are used most often for allowing either water or or ions are the most common things. And they're just generally open almost all of the time. If they weren't, if they were opening and closing, that would by definition make them a gated channel. Um, examples of gated channels, including the presence or absence of uh, chemicals like messenger molecules, we call it, or what we, the word we use is ligand, that would be something that binds to the channel and triggers a change in that channel's conformation. We have voltage sensitive ones. We call them voltage gated channels. We talk about those a lot in, in a few weeks. And the fact that you can hear my voice right now is due to the fact that you have sound waves entering your ear that create vibrations and then liquid waves actually. And those liquid waves move channels inside your inner ear in the organ of Cordy. There are what are called hair cells, and those, cell, those hairs don't have actual hairs. They have little what are called stereocilia, and those stereocilia vibrate at certain frequencies, and when they vibrate, they open and close sodium channels. So it's a mechanically gated channel. Very, very cool. They have to have an existing gradient, otherwise the material would not move across the plasma membrane. These are passive channels. And they aren't quite as specific. They can be pretty specific, but they're not quite as specific, uh, and they lack the ability to be as specific, shall we say, as a carrier protein, which has many, many more points of interaction than, than a channel will. Channels are often protein complexes, like this one from the side, looking down from the top. You have these four transmembrane subunits that create a little space right here. And that space can have, you can have charged amino acids around here to prevent certain types of uh, anions or cations from moving through there, but also size can be a, a factor. So here we can see this is a crystal structure of a channel complex, and the red ones, I believe, are positive and the green ones are negative. So there's a lot of positive um, uh, amino acid side chains here. That probably means that this is an anion channel, that something negative is going through here. Um, but we also can regulate for size. Cations tend to be much smaller because they, they, they have a lot more pull on the electrons that they do have. Anion channels tend to be much larger, but again, why would why would this not allow cations to go through? Because we would have charge there, and it would repel the the cations. That's just a guess, but that's but size and charge are the two main factors. So here here now we have the gated channels, and these are just examples. Again, here's a voltage gated channel with one voltage going on here and another here. You can see it's open when it's in this when the voltage is like so. We have a couple of different ligand gated channels. We have one that's that's gated to extracellular uh, components, and we have one that's gated to intracellular signals. Again, we're going to see examples of these uh, several times uh, in future lectures. Here's our mechanically gated channel. It's just kind of abstract here. Uh, it, again, it's using physical force to open and close the channel. Our next set of proteins sort of resemble like a revolving door, um, you know, and I was looking for some revolving door videos and all I could come with with were, were uh, failure kind of situations. Um, you know, you see these things all the time. Um, and these are jokes time immemorial. I mean, we've been doing this kind of a joke since for over a hundred years now. But anyway, let's look at this first video right here. Now, don't worry about this guy in the red, but what do you see going on? We see a binding, a change in conformation, and eventually a release, okay? Binding, non-covalent binding, change in conformation of the door, and then eventually a release. That's how carrier proteins do their thing. So carrier proteins over here on the right of this figure, they never form an open channel. They always bind, change conformation, and release. Very much like an enzyme in that way. They bind, they'll change shape, and they'll release, uh, fundamentally not changing the, the protein itself. That's, so like a catalyst. 
there are three sort of flavors that, that uh, carrier proteins consist of. Some carriers will only bind one kind of molecule, one kind of substrate, and move it across the membrane. We call those uniporters. Like a unicycle only has one wheel, a uniporter only has one type of molecule it binds. It might bind closely related molecules, that's entirely possible. A lot of inhibitors of uniporters are closely related molecules that can bind but can't be transported. Then we have the carriers that can, that can move more than one uh, uh, type of molecule. Uh, if they move in the same direction, we call those symporters, and this just happens to transport two, but some of them are three, and some of them are even four uh, uh, transporters, carriers. And so they bind them, and they, they move across in the same direction. And then lastly, we have the antiporters. Now, this one happens to be active transport here. It doesn't have to be an active transporter to be an antiporter. This could be facilitated diffusion as well. In any case, it's moving two or more um, uh, substrates, two or more molecules in opposite directions. In this case, this one's moving sodium one way and potassium another, an antiporter. I like to do the old disco move with one thumb up and one thumb down and you flip them back and forth. That's because they're moving in opposite directions. And so carrier transporters can be, can be facilitated in nature. That is to say, they will bind, change conformation, and release to facilitate something moving down its concentration gradient. We just happen to have a, a little analogy over here. We're using like the Panama Canal, for instance. You open the gates, let the molecule to be transported in. You change conformations. You open the gates and let the, let the molecule out. Very similar analogy to that. Carrier proteins in that way, in that binding change conformation release, can carry larger molecules that normally couldn't get across by virtue of their size and or their charge, but they can be very, very specific. They can, they can bind something very, very specifically. Uh, I'll give you an example of, of, a, of a very, very specific carrier. There is a, a drug that we use for Parkinson's. It's called L-DOPA. We use L-DOPA because L-DOPA has a carrier protein that will transport it into the, uh, the, cent the, the, cerebral, the cerebral spinal fluid. We would preferably like to give those patients dopamine, but the problem is dopamine, which is closely related to L-DOPA, can't get across the, the blood-brain barrier. You can't move dopamine across a blood-brain barrier. So instead, we have to give the patients L-DOPA, and the L-DOPA will get converted to dopamine inside the brain. That's a, an excellent example of a carrier protein that's very specific. Even closely related molecules can't get across. And just another figure, just reinforcing. Again, uniporters will bind one molecule and facilitate its, its uh, movement. If it's uh, going down a concentration, that would be facilitated diffusion. If it's going up its concentration, that would be active transport. Symporters, more than one molecule, more than one type of molecule, both going in the same direction. Antiporters, more than one type of molecule going in opposite directions. With this slide, I'm going to add a little, one more layer to the to the uh, to the, the the situation. If we have an artificial compartment here that's low in glucose concentration, and we drop that uh, glucose, one of the glucose transporter proteins in the GLUT family, we put that transporter protein in here, and we've got high glucose on the outside. Sure, glucose can now move across that membrane where it otherwise could. And it'll diffuse down until you reach equilibrium. But that glute transporter doesn't know which way is which, and it will facilitate diffusion of glucose in both directions equally when we reach equilibrium. And that's a problem. If we only achieved equilibrium, what would happen is we would have all this glucose that never makes it into the cell, never gets metabolized, never gets brought in after we've worked so hard to get that glucose. Think about a human being 50,000 years ago, probably in a caloric deficit situation, go out, fought hard for those calories, and then uh, you know half of them can't make it into the cell. That's no good. So what we do is we, we work the system. As glucose comes in, it gets immediately metabolized, 
first of all by hexokinase using ATP. You remember that that phosphor that phosphorylation step I talked about earlier. That molecule can now be uh, either made into glycogen or it can be made into uh, we move it down into make ATP. So what we're doing is we're maintaining a gradient by metabolizing that molecule so that only glucose has to move in. You don't have to invest energy getting the rest of that glucose into the cell. All you do is metabolize and the glucose will come in for you. Pretty neat stuff. Like I said before, the universe will try to reach equilibrium and cells and tissues and organisms will work to prevent that equilibration from ever occurring. Pretty neat stuff. So for a moment, let me show you where this starts to go. Uh, I'll talk about active transport in just a second, because, but I'm going to use this example. Every cell in the body, by and large, uses this system as sort of a moving sidewalk, if you will. And that's why you burn over 150 pounds of ATP every day, despite uh, whatever your body weight is. What's going on is that you have your cell here, and the cell is, for whatever reason, allowing sodium in. Maybe it's allowing it just to leak in like this leak channel here, or maybe it's involved with a sim porter or an anti porter to bring something else in that otherwise wouldn't come. In either case, we're bringing in sodium. Well, we want to sustain that gradient, so we're going to use ATP to pump that sodium back out using active transport. Uh, we use primary active transport generally to move sodium, and the protein is called the sodium potassium ATPase. There it is, the sodium potassium ATPase, sometimes called the sodium potassium pump. I like the word ATPase because it tells you what it's doing. It's hydrolyzing ATP. Anytime you see that word ACE, like synthase, you can think synthesis, uh, synthetic. So we're using ATP to move sodium and potassium uh, across the plasma membrane. It's an antiporter, so potassium is coming in, sodium is going out. And I'm going to show you that mechanism here in just a second. But there are uniporters as well, like our calcium ATPase that we'll talk about in, uh, in neurons and muscle. Uh, in your stomach, you have proton pumps. Have you ever heard of the drugs called PPIs, or uh, there was a famous one called Tagamet? They used to prescribe these quite a bit for folks who were suffering from ulcers because they thought that people had too much acid. Turned out it had to do with the, uh, the actually the, the population of bacteria in their stomach. But in any case, these PPIs block the proton ATPase, which is also a uniporter, which was why your stomach has a pH of somewhere around one or two. We also have proton potassium ATPases, another antiporter. So, but what the, the thing that, that links them all together is they're all hydrolyzing ATP to move uh, to move substrates against their concentration gradients. So we're using hydrolysis of an energy containing molecule, usually ATP. So we're moving things against the gradient. Um, sometimes Though when we get to secondary active transport, we're going to be using a gradient made by primary in order to do this drive. This is all about primary here. When we get to secondary, we'll talk about it. But uh, beware, I am going to talk about secondary and even tertiary active transport down the line. The key is that active transport generates a gradient because you're moving things up their concentration gradient. And either that just solves the problem or we use the gradient to solve some other problem uh, using that energy that's stored up in that gradient. So the fundamental mechanism is that three sodiums bind on the inside of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, the door. We hydrolyze a molecule of ATP. It shifts the, the, uh, uh, shifts the, 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 the the, the sodiums to the outer side of the membrane. We release the sodium and we bind, and in the same time, we're binding two potassiums and shifting them in. So we have three going out, two going in for every molecule of ATP. Let's work through this in a little bit higher detail. This would be maybe the very first big mech of the semester. The 
we are going to start with the channel on the inside aimed at the inside of the cell those sodiums are binding and they have to bind high affinity sites because otherwise they wouldn't bind very well there's something called the law of mass action that i haven't yet covered um, I will probably cover it at a later date, but in any case, if we have, because sodium is relatively low in here, we have to have high affinity to get them to bind. Once they bind, we hydrolyze that ATP and we're phosphorylating the protein. This is, this is a post-translational modification, okay? If you really wanted to play that game, this doesn't happen until we bind those ions, which means that even though these ions, these sodium ions are substrates because we're moving them, they're also behaving as cofactors because you can't hydrolyze ATP. This, this protein will not cycle with ATP unless sodium is bound. Okay, that makes the sodiums both a substrate and a cofactor. When we when we bind when we when we when we transfer that phosphate on there we use it's a kind this protein is using a kinase activity to do that it changes the shape of the the protein so it's a post translational modification technically speaking and that change in conformation not only aims the protein to the outside of the cell it also changes that affinity because why outside the cell we have tons of sodium. We, if you have tons of sodium, those and it's still high affinity, those sodiums would never release. So when we're changing the conformation of the protein, we're also changing the sodium binding sites so that those sodiums get released. So a change in affinity for sodium. The next step is that we have created some new sites for potassium. Even though sodium and potassium are both cations, these are different sites than the sodium ones. So now, but these are high affinity sites for potassium. Why? Because potassium is so low out here, it would never bind unless these were high affinity. Now we're going, when potassium binds, potassium is also acting like a cofactor here because this wouldn't happen without potassium. When potassium binds, this phosphatase activity kicks in. We pop that inorganic phosphate off and we flip the protein once again, changing the affinity yet again for potassium so because otherwise because there's so much potassium in here already these guys would never release if we didn't change that affinity they have to be high affinity here or they would never bind but when it's aimed inside the cell it has to be high, uh, low affinity or would never release so we're not only changing the orientation of the protein we're also changing the shape of those binding sites and then we begin again with more binding of, of so so I'm going to wrap up here. Again, know that we're, that we're moving three sodiums for every two potassiums, and that it's a sequential order. We bind three sodiums, that causes post-translational modification in the form of phosphorylation. We flip the protein. You see it's aimed here inside. Now it's outside, but notice the shape of the binding sites too. We've changed the affinity. We then bind potassium in, in these sites you can see over here on the right, they're open, but once those sodiums are released, now the potassiums can. When those bind, we kick off that inorganic phosphate, it's phosphatase activity, change shape yet again. So instead of being aimed outside, we're now aimed inside. And again, the shape of those binding sites have changed and we pop off those potassiums because otherwise they wouldn't release. There's too much potassium here. And we renew the cycle three in or three out two in for every ATP that we hydrolyze I'm going to talk about this more in class I have a few other things I want to point out but we've been going long enough today and so I'll leave you today since we've uh, gone long enough with a question is Homer Simpson being transported by diffusion or is this active transport Anyway, thanks for your time. That's the it. That's it for uh, this unit, unit one. Uh, we'll have a little more discussion about this uh, chapter in class. And um, good luck on uh, the upcoming exam. See you later.